You see, so much of the church we've been taught, like, anxiety, just don't have it, just don't think about it. If you do it, if you have it, if you think about it, you're, you're in sin. But it doesn't say, and how do we actually deal with this? So first, rejoice. Zoom out a little bit. Number two, he says, so don't be anxious about anything. Don't be anxious. That's that Miranaho, uh, Miramaho. The, the, the idea behind that, and we said this each week, is, is fear is not anxiety. Stress is not anxiety. Anxiety is anxiety. Fear is there's a bear in the room. Stress is there's a bear coming in the room at 10 p.m., so I better be prepared for it. Anxiety is what if a bear comes in the room, right? But what if a bear comes in the room so much that it kind of struggles and, and chokes out and destroys everything inside of me? And so Paul says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to pray about it and everything. I want you by prayer. In other words, I want you to go to God. And this is not just generally, God, let me worry to you about this thing. This is, this is Sermon on the Mount type of prayer. This is our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be your name. God, I'm going to sit back and notice that you're in heaven, I'm not. Holy is your name, not holy is my name. And you are my Father, so you intimate in your care. God, your kingdom come. God, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then he says, okay, now I want you to go through, through some some supplication, some petition, which are individual requests to God. And this is where we really drilled down last week. And if you didn't take anything from last week, this is the thing that I would say you should do your difficult heart excavation in. Because we oftentimes have specific requests to God about the environment of our anxiety, but not the anxiety of it itself. Well, again, what do I mean by that? We can spend more time praying that the person that we need to have a difficult, uncomfortable, confrontational conversation with is receptive to it, then we can praying through the fact that, God, I don't want to have this conversation because what I'm secretly afraid of is they won't like me, and I am so desperate for people to like me and to want me and to need me that I don't want to have this conversation because I'm really afraid that they're going to go away from me. So, God, would you help me to know whether or not I'm liked, I'm loved? And then he said, I want you to do this with rejoicing or I'm sorry I want you to do this with thanksgiving so you said what if we just paused you have stuff going on in life you have anxiety happening in life you have things that are happening so much stress so much pressure what if we all just paused and said okay God let me just be thankful for a second and we did a big group experiment where we all paused and said okay let me pray about this and in my thankfulness to God what I'm actually doing is reciting the faithfulness of God because every time I say something I'm thankful for it's almost always something historical something that God has done consequently I'm actually remembering the faithfulness of God and what are the things that you need to know when you are facing stressful and anxiety-filled situations. Number one, that God is big, that God is in control, and God, I'm deferring to your will. Number two, it's that God, I want you to speak to the heart of what's happening inside of me, not the heart of what's happening inside my environment. And number three, God, I want to know that you are there and that you care. And so if the first one was the, the posture of rejoicing, the second one was the practice of how we pray through it. The third thing that Paul gives us today is this, is this interesting reframing and rephrasing. Because all of those kind of had to do with, with how I'm feeling, not necessarily what I'm thinking. Let me try to create separation between those two things. Thinking on 30,000 feet, metal tube of death, right? Or thinking is I'm in an airplane. That's another way to say that, okay? Thinking is statistically likely improbable of me crashing. Feeling, I'm going to die, right? I I'll, I'll never, I'll never um, forget. This was probably one of the more insensitive things I've said. If anybody's ever seen the show uh, or the movie Final Destination, which I don't need to bring that back up, but I was on the tra a plane one time, and there was some dude who was next to me who was super nervous. And in the movie Final Destination, they take off, and a plane doesn't make it much past takeoff. And I, there's this guy who's kind of nervous, and I was like, bro, this kind of feels like Final Destination. <laughs> Got him. <laughs> he was kind of tough, so I needed to, like, show him who was boss in this section of rows, right? <laughs> Anyways, pray for me. Here's, here's, here's the point of this, right? The thinking is I can know that's true, but the feeling is I can feel like it's not. And so a lot of this to this point has dealt with, like, how do we feel about these things? But what I think I love about Paul, or what I love about Paul, and I think it's so incredible, is he actually says, let me for a second attack how we think. How we think. Our mindset, how we think about things, how we conceptualize things. 
is vitally important as a famous book that is titled, As a Man Thinketh, so is, he, so is He, is actually derived from Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7 in the King James Version, where it basically says the same thing, that as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. As Jesus put it, from the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? The things that we have, the things that we feel, the things that we think, those are the things that we do. Paul said, don't conform to the patterns of this world, be transformed, why? By, or how? By the renewing of your mind. In other words, let's think about how we think about the things that are making us nervous. And let me just say one more thing about anxiety for everybody who doesn't feel anxious already. I think this is the biggest hindrance that we face as a church. I think this is the biggest hindrance that we face as a church. Many of us don't read our Bible. And it's not because we don't think we should or we don't think we ought to. It's because secretly and inside of us, we have an anxiety because we haven't in a while. A lot of us, we know we should pray. We just don't because we know we haven't, ha we haven't done it in a while. And we have anxiety around what's going to happen and what is it going to feel like and what's God going to say and what is God going to think. I know I should join a group, but I have anxiety because I'm new and I don't really know that much. I know I should serve, but I just, I just don't know if I have enough time. I don't know if I have the capacity. I know I should give, but I just don't know if I have much margin. I just don't know if I have much, enough, enough to actually like, provide and go around. Now, you think about all the different areas that we struggle, and almost all of them are attached to some type of an anxiety. So all that to say is that Paul then goes through and says, okay, with those anxious thoughts, basically, with those anxious thoughts, I want to give you a framework or a thought process that helps you to evaluate the legitimacy of those thoughts. Because the last thing you want to do, the last thing you want to do is have something that legitimately should make you fearful and stressed and just dismiss it. And so Paul says, okay, let me give you a thing. In other words, how to take this thought and make it captive to Christ. So this is what he says. He says, so finally, brothers, in other words, this is kind of like, let me summarize this. He says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Now, in prep time for this, um, I spent some time doing this. And I'm just going to be honest. It's, it's weird. Like, you think about it. Like, okay, so what he's saying is, I want you to think about these things. I want you to, to dwell on these things. I want you to process or evaluate these things. And so I started to think, okay, God, I'm going to do this. So I sat on my couch and I started thinking, okay, God, I'm just going to think about what is, what is true. And I'm like, two plus two is four. That's true, right? Unless you combine two plus a two together, and that makes 22, okay? So that's, that's also true. Like, I'm literally thinking these things in my prayer time. And I'm starting to think, okay, what else is true? Jesus, you're true. Okay, that's true. Uh, yeah, that's true, okay? You know, and so I'm starting to think, okay, just like generally speaking, if I'm going to dwell on things that are true, and it became really interesting because I'm like, ah, I'm thinking about things that are true, but it's not necessarily like drawing me closer to God, per se, just like the grass is green, that's true. Unless it hasn't rained in a while, then it turns slightly brown, and that's also true. When I started to think about this and, and, and taking a deep dive into that, that final word, it says, you know, to think about these things. Think about these things. Dwell on these things. It's this, it's this word that's kind of an accounting word. It's like this legismo type uh, a Greek word where the essence of what it means is, is to really take and calculate, to compare, to contrast, to take thoughts and hold them up to this lens. And so I started to think about this in the context of what he's saying because what he's talking about, again, is anxiety. And one of the things that we have with anxiety is anxious thoughts. So it's almost like I want you to cross-examine the anxious thoughts that you have through this lens, not just generally whatever is true, but is the thing that you're actually thinking about now true? In other words, is it true? Well, the reason I don't read my Bible, if I'm really being honest, is because I haven't done it in a while. I'm anxious. 
I'm anxious because I've done a lot of stuff recently. I've done a lot of stuff. I mean, I haven't read. Yes, that's true. But I've also gotten angry with my wife. I've been selfish with my finances. I've also, you know, I, I, I've yelled at my roommate. I also, you know, did whatever with my boyfriend or girlfriend, right? Like, here's the things that I have done. And man, I just don't feel like God loves me, and I feel like I have been in sin. Well, there's two parts of that. Have you been in sin? Yes. But the gospel also clearly declares that it's not because of our righteousness that we're made right with God. Right? It's because of his righteousness, because of his death, his death on the cross. So you have to ask this question. Like, is it actually true? Think about it. One of my friends, this was a very backhanded uh, compliment, which is why I, I love my friends. Because, you know, I always want friends that are like, you know, one of the ways pastors, I think, get in trouble is they just don't have friends that will make fun of them. If you ever find me with friends that don't make fun of me, then please find another pastor. Because this is what he said. I loved it. He was, he was kind of like around a birthday time. He says, you know, one of the things I love about you, we do appreciations. He says, you know, you never let your brokenness get in the way of God using you. I was like, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> like, I, because it, it was my thought. <laughs> is there any other choice? Right? Like, I am broken. Do you, let me just be honest. Do you know how difficult this is for me? To get up every single week and hold to you a word that is perfect and a God who is perfect and say we should do this knowing that I fall short too. Do you know how much I need to know deep down? Yes, it's true that I'm sinful. God, but you use crooked sticks to draw straight lines and I am just one of those sticks that you have chosen to use to draw this type of a straight line. And so God, I need to know that it's true that I am sinful in need of a Savior and I need you, Jesus, every single day. And so I'm going to ask this question. Is it whatever is true? So I'm, this is the question I'm going to ask. I've attached a question questions to each one of these things is is all of it true is all of it true did you know the number one the number one way that satan is referred to in the bible is the accuser he will take things that are true and make them condemning as opposed to the gospel he will take things that are true and make you feel shame about them as opposed to realizing we have a god who covers our shame and his name is jesus so whatever is true is all of it true in other words when you feel anxiety creeping up inside of you, simply ask this question. Is all of it true? Next question is this. He says, he says whatever is true, whatever is honorable. Now, this is interesting because I'm like, whatever is honorable, I think of like a judge, right? Like, whatever is honorable, it, it, it's interesting to think about, but let me phrase it in this way. When you're thinking about something, when you're thinking about, okay, I can either take this job or that job. I can either live in this city or I can live in that city. I can either, I can either join this group or this volunteer place, whatever it is, right? And I've, maybe you're feeling some anxiety around some different things. Here's a question. Is one of these more honorable than the other? And that's a really, really difficult thing to think because honorable is subjective, right? So it's a better question. It kind of helps us to zoom out. This is the question that I've attached to this. What would someone who I look up to do? There is somebody in all of our lives that we think is honorable. I mean, this is a really honorable person. It's hard to decide in our kind of, sometimes we're too in the weeds of it. So here's, here's the thing. Man, if there's somebody that I think of as honorable, what would they do? You know what? One of those helpful for me, one of the framings, I do this, I do this often. I think to myself, you know, like, I, you know, what would Jesus do, of course, right? But that's sometimes always like, I don't know. Sometimes I think to myself, what would Tim Keller do? Well, how would he think about this problem? I mean, he just, he always seems to have such a great blend and such balance. Like, what would, what would happen in life if those things that we felt anxious about, we started evaluating and said, number one, is this thing that I'm worried about true? All of it. Number two, what would somebody who's honorable think about or do slash situation? He continues. He says, whatever is just. Whatever is just. Now, I love this idea of just because sometimes in the Christian world, what we actually need to think through the lens of a little bit more is not just what's loving, though that's going to be there. It's what's actually just in this situation. 
Is there one of these options, one of these things that creates a level of just or unjustness? And if it's going to be unjust, I'm going to choose the side of grace on purpose. But is it just? Let me give you an example. So maybe you have, you have somebody who's, maybe you have somebody who is a, a family member, and they continually take advantage of you. I'm sure that's nobody in this room. But it just seems like they overask and they overask and they overassume and they overgo and they overgo and, and they just they kind of push too much or they request too much or they expect too much. And sometimes the question is, should I be patient? Or sometimes the question is, should I be confrontational? Truth and love. So one of the questions to ask is what is just? What is just? In this situation, here's the question that I have attached to this. Is this just or am I trying to justify it? Is it just or am I just trying to do what I can justify? Next thing he talks about. He says, whatever is pure, Whatever is pure, this has a, a level of, of moral and oftentimes a level of, of connotation of sexual purity when he talks about this oftentimes in the Bible. And so he says, you know, okay, now, now number one, yes, is it true? Number two, I've got to ask this question, is it honorable? Number three, is it just? And number four, I mean, is this thing, is, is it pure? Is it going to drive a sense of pureness, holiness, trust in and to God? Here's the question I tossed up with this one that you can ask. Does this create godly purity? Does this create godly purity? Does this actually drive me towards God and purity? Whatever is lovely, whatever is lovely, that idea is not just like beautiful, though it, it includes that idea of, of beauty, but it's also this kind of this sense of like brotherly love, this kind of love for the other person. So it's whatever is lovely. In other words, is to ask kind of this question, is this loving? Real complex, right? Loving and just are both attributes of God. Truth is an attribute of God, right? All of these things that we're talking about, they, they define God, and so we have to ask this question, is it just, but also is it loving? And in its lovingness, am I being just? Let me just say one thing about this, actually, because I really think the, com the combination of justice and, and love are, are really vital. Christians have too long perpetuated places in cycles of, of dependency and harm because it was loving in the moment, but it was not just on the back end. And so let me just be honest. There's times when the church has perpetuated abuse simply because of the fact that we want it to be loving and not just. That's why these are important. He says this is kind of the, the last of the, the whatevers. He says, whatever is commendable. In other words, I want you to think about, uh, another way of saying this is of good or of high reputation. So whatever it is that you would think about, and as people see this, do they see Jesus in this? Will they see this, and what, will it be something that people will say, okay, that's a person who follows Jesus when I see them do this. This is the question I have. Will people see Jesus in this? Commendable, reputation, that's what this has to deal with. Now, let me just pause and say this. I went through six different things, and he kind of categorizes the last couple of things by asking this, by saying these, these words. He says, so if there's anything, if there is any excellence, or if there is anything worthy of praise, I want you to think about these things. If there's anything excellent or anything worthy of praise, I want you to think about these things. And these are kind of like catch-all of like, if there's anything of virtue and that's worthy of praise and acknowledgement, I want you to think about these things. Let me just run through these again. True, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable. Holistically, excellence and worthy of praise. Now let me just ask this question. Especially if you are... Everybody can participate, but especially if you're over the age of 30 in this room. And those times I'd say like 40, but you know, our room is slanted the other direction. Think about the biggest mistake that you've made. That thing that you 
wish more than anything that you could take back. The thing that you hope nobody else knows, and the thing that you hope maybe no one else finds out about, or maybe they did, and good grief, is it hard. Good grief, is it difficult. Good grief, does it keep you up at night? I want you to think about two things. Number one, if you would have thought about this, if you'd have thought, okay, is this true? Am I acting in a way? Does this make sense? I'm, 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 I'm minimizing this conversation because what I, what I feel is like I don't want to, but what I know is true is that I need to have it. What I know is true and what I know is right. What would have happened if you would have thought, what is honorable? What, what would somebody who I deeply respect do in this situation? Whatever is just, is this right? Is this just? Or am I just trying to justify it? Man, is this driving me pure, towards purity? Is this embodied in love? If people know about this, will they think, man, that is a really commendable thing to do? Is it surrounded by the virtue of excellence or just virtue in general? And if there's anything worthy of praise, praiseworthy, then I want you to think about these things. And if you would have thought about that thing that you did in this way, would you have made your biggest mistake in life? And the reason I say over 30 is because if you're under 30, there's a really good chance that you haven't made your biggest mistake yet. This has so much potential. Just lean in for a second. Even if you're not a Christian. Like, I think these words are, words are deeply impactful. But I hope if you're here and you're kind of on the periphery of faith, not really, sure know what, not really sure what you think or what you believe or where you are with God, I'm hoping that maybe this helps to anchor you a little bit more in the fact that God's word actually does make sense. Because especially with the things that we feel anxiety about, what would it take to take, what would it be like to take your most anxious thought and think about it through this lens? Your most anxious thought and ask those questions. Your deepest sense of regret and ask these questions. Well, I think it functionally changes everything. In fact, what I think is beautiful about this is Paul just jumps off that and he says this last thing, which is where we're going to end. He said, I want you to think about these things and what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. Then practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. He says, so, so all of this stuff that you've heard, all of this stuff that you've learned, all of this stuff that you've seen, you've seen it in me, in fact, Paul would say, which honestly is a massive challenge that could I ever get to a point where I'd ever say to the church, hey, you guys have seen all this stuff in me, just do this. Like he lived in such a way that he could with truthfulness about it. It's crazy, isn't it? Like you think about it. If Michael Jordan says I'm the greatest basketball player of all time, he's not being arrogant, he's being right. And if you think other people, then we'll continue to pray for you. You know, the Bible talks about wisdom. But what I love about this is Paul speaks to him. He says, okay, I want you to think about this stuff. And, and, and I have embodied this for you. I have lived in such a way that you have seen this in me. And so what I want you to do is I want you to take these thoughts, take these ideas, take these concepts, take these ways that you think, and I want you to actually do them. I actually want you to apply them. I actually want you to live them out. I don't want them to just stay in the mental place. I want them to make their way to the physical place, so deep-seated inside of your heart that you can't help but act on these things. Because if we actually do what Paul's saying, and the dwell on these things we actually take them divide them cross-examine them and say is it true is it right is it just is it pure do all of these things compel me towards love and am I doing this in such a way where it has this reputation here's what I would guess we would find that most of the things that we're anxious about are just silly and not that they're silly not that they're not stressful or weight-bearing, but they aren't this overly sense in which they control and they constrict and they choke out our lives. So here's what I want you to do with this whole thing. We're going to post all of these questions. We're going to post all of these questions. And I simply want you to do this with your most anxious thought. Everybody to participate? I want you to simply go through and you can use my questions, or you can use questions that make more sense to you. But I simply want you to, at some point, 
this week, ideally today, because if you're like me, I'm like, man, that sounds awesome. And then like two days later, two, you know, shoot, for me, I have ADHD two hours later, sometimes two minutes later, I'm like, oh, there's a bird. So maybe for you, it's in this last song that we sing. And you just say, God, this is what I can't get off of my mind. In fact, the thing that you just talked about, that thing that I can't let go of, that thing that was the biggest mistake that I ever made, that's the thing that makes me anxious. That's the thing that keeps playing. That's the thing that I can't let go of. Did you know that you have a heavenly father who so loves you? Who so, that word kind of can sound flat. That you have a God who so desperately cares for his children. That in spite of our rebellion, in spite of the fact that we've all gone astray, in spite of the fact that every single one of us has had times, nights, days, weekends, trips, seasons, semesters, for some of us decades where we ran from God. And our sin makes us want to hide. Our sin makes us want to cover it up. Our sin makes us want to, and our shame makes us want to pretend like it's not there. But the truth is, is that God knows. And the truth is, he still chose you. You have that thing internally that you think about, and you're just like, God, I just don't know. It's driving this anxiety. Did you know that when we are not honorable, we have the honorableness of God to look up to and to cover us? And so those places of shame that we feel tr deeply dishonor in, God has died and redeemed. And on the cross, he was just. The fullness, the fullness of Jesus, the fullness of God, for the fullness of our rebellion and sin died. That if he would not have paid that sin and just forgiven us, he never would have satisfied the consequence or the price that our sin caused and created in the relational rift. And on the cross, he was just. On the cross, he was pure, the spotless Lamb of God. On the cross, he was not only lovely, it was the most loving thing the world had ever seen. And on the cross, whatever is commendable was the ultimate commendation. It was the ultimate declaration of reputation that you were loved. If there's any virtue, that was where all the virtue was centered around and anything worthy of praise. And because of his death and resurrection, we continually praise him. If God would embody all of this and die for us in light of the fact that we oftentimes don't, then that means every anxious thought that I have, I can take and I can compare it and I can contrast it and say what the gospel says about this. So just let me finish with saying this, this whole thing on anxiety. And if you've checked out, just lean in for one more second. You have a God who so loves you. He does not simply say, don't be anxious. He says, I want you to zoom out and rejoice. I want you to pray, get to the heart of the anxiety. I want you to remember my faithfulness. And let me just tell you, those thoughts that drive anxiety, I want you to dismantle them evaluate them, contrast them. And when you do, I think what actually happens is the anxiety that we feel are places that we're secretly wondering if we're lovable. You have an opportunity in that place of anxiety to experience the love of God like you never have before. The presence of God like perhaps you never have before. And if you were ever wondering if God is big enough, if these things are strong enough, Jesus displayed on the cross the ultimate truth, the ultimate, I'm not going to name them all over again, but Jesus dismantled them on the cross, which means he can dismantle them in your heart. So we're going to end this service and I just want you to pray. We're going to have those questions kind of scrolling on the screen as some of the songs words are playing. 
And I just want you to pray. I want to take that thought captive to Christ and see if there's a level of obedience that's not unlocked in your life. Because all of a sudden, you realize you have a heavenly Father who's holy and who's there and who cares. So let's pray. God, I ask and pray that you would help every single one of us to take our thoughts captive to you, hold them ransom to you, contrast them with you, that we would take these thoughts and we would dwell on them. Whatever's pure, we would hold on to. Whatever's true, we would hold on to. Whatever's just, we would hold on to. Whatever's lovely, we would hold on to. Whatever's excellent, whatever's good, good repute, whatever's praiseworthy. God, would you help our minds and our hearts to be freed to look after you, run after you, our Heavenly Father. And God, would you lodge those things so deep in our hearts that it drives us not just to think them, not just to believe them, but to actually do them. And so God, I pray during this song we would ponder what's our most anxious thought that's driving us from obedience to you and simply begin to say, is it true? Is it true? And as we begin to evaluate, you would lodge deep inside of us the truth of your word. We would feel freedom as we experience your word dividing the lies that perhaps we've been told for a long time. So God, would you give us the wisdom to see this anxiety clearly and these intrusive thoughts, would you give give us the courage to confront them directly? And it's in your name, Jesus, we